All right, friends, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. And Chuck is going to be teaching today, but I wanted to give one quick announcement, and that is that our um, episode nine of the podcast is live. Some of y'all have already heard it, but it covers um, Job, Proverbs, and Esther. And I'm going to be recording this week for our next one, which will cover Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, and that'll probably be up by the weekend. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chuck. Excellent. Welcome. Now, if you haven't been to church yet, I want you to know that John and I did not <laughs> confer with each other. Because um, you will hear, if you go to church at 11, some crossover. I told John he did a pretty good job <laughs> uh, in terms of um, getting Ecclesiastes right. He didn't expand on some of this stuff. We'll expand on a little bit. You'll have sort of the expanded version and understand some of his references. And before we begin, you know, um, it's interesting, using what we discuss about Ecclesiastes, just Ecclesiastes, if you were going to use Ecclesiastes to try and I don't know if you make sense out of it, but try to make sort of peace with what happened in Texas last week. How would you use the writer of Ecclesiastes to interpret those events? Does that make sense? Now, that's all. I'm going to leave time at the end after we discuss what Ecclesiastes is all about. Now understand, as we get into this, Ecclesiastes is going to raise questions and give you no answers. <laughs> There'll be no answers whatsoever. It's very, very different. Now he's going to give you his take on reality, which Rabbi Kushner says is very unsatisfactory, and it probably is unsatisfactory, unless you like to grab for the moment and all the gusto and live in it, but it's very different than other wisdom literature. Um, and you can read 10 commentators and get 10 different takes on it. So um, you're going to ask me a question and I'm going to say it all depends. Well, what's different about that? <laughs> yeah, That's a good yeah, point. Not, <laughs> very good that point. Um, but for this one, it really does all the time. And so um, my two favorite or three favorite people and, and really trying to make sense out of this, Robert Alter, Michael Fox, and C.L. Seow are the three I find most helpful in getting some kind of handle, if there is such a thing, on Ecclesiastes. So with no further ado, let's open the prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time together to focus on your word. Be with us in these moments as we strive to gain some insight into this aspect of your Holy Scripture. Help us to grapple with the questions raised and to come away at least with some inkling of how we can struggle with the very appropriate questions that are before us. So guide us through your spirit now, we pray, in your son's holy name. Amen. 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 Now you have two handouts. Um, one is uh, four pages front and back, and the other one is simply a one page front and back, which I call the cliff notes, um, sort of a summary of um, of the book. So if you want a real quick, boom, what's it all about? The one page front and back will give you that. And the four page is sort of gives you the more in-depth kind of issues we're going to deal with. So as we get into it, most scholars agree that there's no other writing like this in the entire Bible. Uh, that's nice. Um, it is probably written by someone who's older, at least past midlife, who asks serious existential questions for which she has no adequate answers. That's great. You raise questions and you don't have answers. The 
There's nothing more frustrating than that. Not only that, as you read through these 12 chapters, you're going to read and find out this guy contradicts himself over and over and over. And you go, listen, dude, at least you can be consistent. And he's not. So, so don't look for consistency here. You're not going to get it. So the question, what is the true meaning of life? How does one find real happiness and joy? How much is enough for success and security? Is there something that we're supposed to do with our lives? They're all questions that we all ask, right? Now, the other thing I would ask you, most of us here, except maybe and will, are at a point where we can look back in our lives and ask, what in the world has it all been about? What has been significant or brought real purpose to what we're all about? Right? My question to you, and you don't have to answer it now, my question to you is you're reading through this and you think about it, how would you answer that for yourself? How would you answer that? Uh, because that's really what he's trying to get at. And so you look at this, and Michael Fox says that every interpretation of Ecclesiastes has to answer three questions. What is Koalith? And that is the, the name of the author, meaning preacher or teacher, negating and complaining about what is he affirming and recommending? And what are his underlying reasons for each? Those are the things you've got to keep in your mind. These existential and interpretive questions are the ones to keep before us as we read and reflect on the text. We may not find easy or comforting answers, but they're the questions we have to keep before us before, as we encounter the challenges and the perplexities of life. Now, and he talks about all kinds of situations in life, all kinds. He's really looking back and saying, I've experienced this, I've observed this, I've seen this, and that's why I say, think about what happened next week. Because that sort of fits into, okay, I've looked at life, and this is my conclusion. Now, there's a sense of loss or resignation about life. And when you look at that, the big picture, his question is, does it make any sense? Now, if you have a, a text, have a Bible, you open it up to the very beginning, and you look at verse 2 and 3. Right at the beginning, he gives you his reflection on reality. And perhaps it's the famous one of the most famous verses of the entire text, when you think about Ecclesiastes. Depending on your translation, he says, utter futility, says Koalit, utter futility, all is futile. What real value is there for a man for all the gains he makes beneath the sun? That's the first thing to see. You read that. And what's your initial response? I don't agree. I mean, you look at that and you go, what a real positive guy this dude is. <laughs> I mean, that is his initial take on reality. I got news for you. That's how it's going to end, too, in chapter 12. He says, now, looking back on all this and all my observations, this is where he is coming from. So you're going to say, you're going to go to him when you want to uplift and be uplifted in life? I mean, you go. Now, remember one of my questions was, if again, when you look back for him trying to make sense of last week, at the end, I want you to, because we're going to try and see it through his eyes. You're looking for him to be counseling, to counsel you. But that's what he looks at. Now, he goes, Kushner, Rabbi Kushner, in his book, and everything you wanted in life isn't enough, says this may be the most dangerous book in life. When you think about it, you go, oh, 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 oh. if you're a pastoral counselor, you're going to go to this book for guidance and direction? 
Really? And, and you say, how in the world does it get into the cannon? Now, how do you think it got into the cannon? Um, look at verse 1. Um, it is attributed to Solomon. It wasn't Solomon, but it's attributed to Solomon. And that, most commentators argue, probably is the thing that shoehorned it into the canon. I mean, editors weren't stupid. They wanted this thing in the canon, and that the way to, to get it there. But that's sort of the conjecture. Um, interesting, Oscar Wilde, page two, says, you know, there are two tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want, the other one's getting it. Um, and, and one of the things that you have to ask is, why is happiness satisfaction so elusive for both those who get what they want and those who don't? And one of the things that you realize probably too late in life is that money and power do not satisfy or bring you or fill that unnameable hunger of the soul. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, people don't discover that until way too late. But that's, that's it. Now, when you read through this this week, there's only 12 chapters. You're going to see this dude tried everything. He tried everything. And none of it worked. At least, I say none of it worked. None of it, in none of the things he experienced or observed, did he find meaning in life. Real meaning, real purpose. It just didn't pan out for him the way he expected. And you come up with vanity, vanity, always vanity. So, the question then becomes, how in the world does this thing all work out? And as you look at the commentators, and um, we talk about that in the rest of this page, is that um, the writer probably is older and has experienced life a little bit. Um, and so you've down the bottom, the author identified as Cole, that literally means teacher or preacher, is a person who had access probably to royal influence, affluence, and power with a wide range of experience in life. Now, in the opening verse we mentioned a second ago, he's called the son of David. But it might mean only that he was either from a Davidic line, but the Jewish and Christian tradition has famously identified himself. And because of the epithet, that's probably why it gets in the camp. It is best to think of Cole as a literary persona of a radical philosopher articulating an evocative rhythmic prose that occasionally scans as poetry, a powerful descent from mainline wisdom outlook. That is the background of his thought. Now, it has been long recognized as one of the later books of the Hebrew Bible. Some scholars are tempted to see it as an influence of Greek philosophy, but C.L. Siao argues convincingly, and I tend to see his argument as valid, on linguistic grounds, that the text was probably written a few decades before the conquest of Alexander the Great in 330, 333 BCE. His unblinking provocative reflections on the ephemerality of life, the flimsiness of human value, and the ineluctable fate of death read like the work of a stubborn, prickly original. One who in all likelihood wrote in the early or middle decades of the 4th century BCE. His frequent invocation of the terms drawn from bookkeeping reflect the mercantile economy of the period. His class identity is uncertain, though his politics are conservative. So we're talking 400 to 350 BC, somewhere in there. Koalith offers pragmatic counsel that one might expect to find in Proverbs. However, and this is important, 
his observations are properly philosophic, inviting the reader to contemplate the cyclical nature of reality and of human experience and the fleeting duration of all that one cherishes, the brevity of life, the inexorability of death, which levels all things. He's a writer who works out philosophic thought through poetic prose. He, is a, he has a finely developed sense of expressive rhythm. He makes central use of refrains and other devices of repetition, the stylic, stylistic repetition serving as correlative for the cycle of repetition that, in his view, characterizes the underlying structure of reality. Now, as you look at this, Kushner says, I love it. It's the work of an angry, cynical, skeptical man who doubts God and questions the values of anything good. Chapter one again. You look at verse four. What point is there work of, in working hard? One generation uh, passes and another comes along, but the world remains the same forever. And then he goes through talking about the cyclical nature of what reality is all about from four to eight. And then in verse 9 in chapter 1, he says, there's nothing new under the sun. What's happened before, what's going to happen now, will happen again. Think about my question at the beginning. And, and so he said, ah, it's all the same. So don't expect anything new to take place. And he, he that's sort of, um, Fox would say that's, that is the prologue for his case. And that you really don't start this book until you get to verse 12 uh, in chapter one. That really is the beginning of what you have for this. Now, one of the things to, to say, okay, well then what is his method? I don't know whether Bill mentioned this last week with Proverbs, but the whole perspective of Proverbs from verse seven and one it's the beginning of wisdom is what? Fear of God. Fear of God. The awe of God. So it is, from a perspective, theocentric. God goes. Note, not here. In verse 12 of 1, he says, I call it the king of Jerusalem over Israel, 13. I set my mind to study and to probe with wisdom all that happens under the sun. An unhappy business, that which God gave uh, men to be concerned with, I observed the happenings beneath the sun, and I found that, in, that all was futile. A pursuit, some translations say, a herding of the wind. His approach <coughs> is philosophic, using reason, observation, and experience. And you will see as you read throughout the first person pronoun, I. I set my mind to, I observe, I experience. It is anthropocentric. It is human focus. So you have wisdom defined in Proverbs as God focus, wisdom defined here as human centered. So it's a different approach. You have a different, it's a fancy word, epistemology. And so, as you stop and think about that, what does that lead you to think about in terms of the conclusions one will reach when you, when you approach wisdom that way? Any conjecture? Your conclusions aren't going to be any bigger than yourself. <laughs> and keep that in mind as you read through and see his conclusion. Um, because that's, that, that's, a, that's a different approach. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just different. And you say, oh, okay. And if you have a different approach, it's all you can do. You'll come out in a different place. And so that's that's something to, to, to keep in mind as you as you get into that. Now, um, as you as you look at this, 
and you come down, he also rejects, we t we've talked about several times, the Deuteronomic approach to Jewish tradition, which is, remember? You're, you're obedient to God, good things happen, you're disobedient, bad things happen. Perfect. And he says, because <laughs> look on page four, it says basically most scripture says that God cares about what we do and why and who we are. Coleth comes along and tells us that God does not, in fact, care about any of that. Rich and poor, wise and foolish, righteous and wicked are all the same in God's eyes, regardless of how they live. They grow old and they die and are soon forgotten. How we live makes no difference. What? What? And as you go through, that's one of the frustrating things for him. He says, why should I work hard and get wealthy? When I die, I got to leave it to Will. <laughs> I don't know whether he's going to be wise yeah, or not. Yeah, you got I'm going to say, she's the least. Why should I do that? And he's going to say, wicked or, or righteous, the great leveler in life is death. 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 Everybody. Oh, my God. There's no ways. Doesn't that make any difference what we do? In the end, we all die. <laughs> and it's like, oh. And he's going to say, so this Deuteronomic approach? I mean, yeah. And so when you, when you read through that, you're going to say to yourself, where is this guy coming from? Where is he coming from? And you know, all the stuff we've read up to now, you're going to say, what? And, and so, uh, just be ready for that. <coughs> be ready for that. And, and so you're going, to, you're going to scratch your head and say, I don't, I don't want to fit this dude in. I just want to comment. I, rem I, I believe a comment that Will's made several times, that two different things can be true at the same time. And I, and I think sometimes when we read the Bible and we use our Western rational way of looking at it, uh, if this thing is true, this thing is false. And that's just the way it is. It's baked in. And uh, I, I, am I quoting you correctly, Will? Uh, I don't know if I said that, but I would agree with it. <laughs> depending on what we're talking about, right? <laughs> I, I, I think I remember you saying that the more than one thing can be true at the same time, which I agree with. And uh, and that's kind of part of my reaction is that it's almost like a spontaneous reaction here that Willis has uh, that you know sometimes life doesn't work out the way they say in Proverbs. And and I in my life I say yeah I agree I think there's sometimes good people suffer, and I don't like that. Uh, and some of my friends have died of COVID that I went to seminary with. Some very good friends, and they were making a difference in the world, and now they're gone. And I, I'm thinking, no, that wasn't just. That wasn't right. That's not what they deserve. So in that sense, uh, Ecclesiastes is correct. Uh, and other, other people are nasty cheaters, and they do well. <laughs> <laughs> they buy the right stock at the right time, yeah. and now they have a yacht, you know, and they're thinking, holy cow, I bought Apple, and now where is it at, you know? And it, <laughs> so again, I did make a comment that I think, uh, you know, I, sometimes, and I include myself, we're, we're very dualistic here, and if this thing is right, this thing is wrong, that's just the way it is. And they can't be wrong or right at the same time. And I'm thinking, well, that's how I was taught to think growing up in the Western world. Yep. And it works most of the time that works. Uh, but there are times when it doesn't work. And so that's, to me, my reaction reading. And I agree, it's just really, whoa, what a book here. What a book. But sometimes he's right. Yep. Sometimes he's right. So, and... Uh, good point. Good point. I want to highlight, as you read through, you're going to come across over and over again two phrases. Mention one uh, in the middle of four, the key, what I call the refrain. 
vanity, vanity of vanities, King James, vanity, vanity, all's vanity, utility, utility, all's futile. That is a key phrase to really put a wrap your mind around. Throughout the text, it is repeated, repeated. I call it the refrain. And so when you see something repeated in scripture, anyway, you want to draw a line around. It. And and basically it's saying, okay. He's saying it over and over and over and over and over again. What the heck does it mean? Well, let's think about it. Robert Alter translates it. Merest breath, all is mere breath. Michael Fox renders it, utter futility, all is futile. It literally means mist or vapor, senseless, absurd, Hence, futile, fleeting, and illusory. It is key to the author's conclusion about the meaning of life. The Hebrew, Havel, Havel Havalim, is what we're talking about here, probably indicates, which is sort of neat, the flimsy vapor that is exhaled and breathing, the in invisible except in a cold winter day. And in any case, immediately dissipating in the air. Ever been in a cold weather and they go, oh. so you come out. Can you grab a hold of that? Can't grab a hold of that, can you? Because you can see it, but then it's gone. It is the opposite of ruach, life breath in Hebrew, which is the animating force in the living creature. Because Havel is the waste product. If then one wanted to line up the abstractions implied by Havel, it would include not only futility, absurdity, and vanity, but at least insubstantiality, ephemerality, and elusiveness as well. Havel, breath or vapor, is something utterly insubstantial and transient, and in this book suggests futility, ephemerality, and also, as Fox argues, the absurdity of existence. That is a key phrase. And for Koalith, how he understands reality. Now, you don't have to agree with him. I'm not saying you should agree with him. But it is his understanding of how he has experienced life. Now, there may be days where you agree with him. <laughs> or, or you've had a bad day, and you say, blah, absurd, absurd, it's all absurd. What's the use of it all? But that's where he is, that phrase being repeated over and over and over again. Again, remember where he's coming from. Reason, observation, experience. And you're going to go through. He's going to tell you, this is my, what I've talked about. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter, and chapter 3 he's going to talk about uh, in, in the, the sermon today. And several other spots, too. So, all is mere breath, Alter. Constant repetition from the initial verse onward gives us the rhythmic prose, colon, and incantatory power at the same time registers one of the principal themes that it is the very nature of reality for all things constantly to repeat themselves. The next key verse or key repetition is what I call the chorus. You have the refrain, and now the chorus, which appears repeatedly again throughout Ecclesiastes and provides a clue to Koalith's answer to his dilemma. Now, it's Koalith's answer you may not agree with. I'm not asking you to. We're looking at Koalith. And it appears for the first time in 2.24, I quoted it. And he goes through and says, look at wealth, getting all that he needs. And he talks about getting all this idea of wealth in that period. And he said, then you get it, and you die. What good does it do? Well, I get all this wealth, I die, and somebody else gets it. And they spend it. Oh, oh what good is that? I die, and Martin gets it. 
what does that good do? Does that do me? Whoa. I mean, and then he says, so what's the answer to this? What should you do? There is nothing worthwhile for a man but to eat, drink, and afford himself enjoyment with his meals. Well, John's going to say, that's going to be the thing. So he said, you better just enjoy what you got. I try to illustrate that when the Titanic sunk and you look at the newspaper accounts the next day, they list the millionaires who died, which is fascinating. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and in this tragedy in 1912 that shook the world, uh, you know, these people that had so much money and power, they're dead. An interesting point of view. Oh, this is point of view. Yeah. yeah. Futility, futility, all is futility. Yep. yep. And, and look where it's repeated. It's there in 2.24. You're going to see it in the scripture passage today, chapter 3, 3, 12, 13, chapter 5, chapter 8, chapter 9, 7. It's a little extended there. It's sort of an extended part of that. And then again in chapter 11. Again, little twist of, of, in terms of, of how it's stated, but it's in every single place. Let's turn but, but and have this uh, the Bible to chapter 9. But so maybe nine this is why they've attributed this book to Solomon, not just so that you've got the famous guy, right. but he had it all. And he, he could, you know, that's very believable that here's yep, a guy sure. who had it all. At the end of his life, this is his reflection, and of course, we know what happens after that. Right. One son goes this way, an interloper takes most of the oh, kingdom. So he, he could almost be looking back from heaven and writing, it was all futility. You could make that argument. You really could. And so, anybody have chapter 9, verse 7, and read through um, 10? Chapter 9, verse 7. Go eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let your oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life. And in your toil at which you toil under the sun, whatever your hands find to do, do with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shale to which you are going. <laughs> there you go. There you have it. I mean, enjoy Most what you got. Yeah. 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 And, and so you, you, you have to ask yourself, is that ultimately his answer? As he repeats it over and over exactly. and over and over. Now, and again, he talks about the cyclical nature of life. John's going to read, he talks about the birds singing for every season there is, for every season there is a time. Are you doing the do out chorus on it? I may go to love it if you are. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, but, but, but the whole idea of the cyclical nature of time is going to happen over and over again. So time is for this and that and that. So therefore, might as well enjoy what you got. I mean, and, and, and so you look at that, is that really, and I don't have the answer. I'm just raising the question. Is that his ultimate answer to how you deal with the futility of reality? Well, I got a comment on this. You've got a person, this is a single person opinion. And it sort of reminds me of a clinical trial when one patient is a sample if you're trying to judge how a drug works. So how did it how did it get in the book and stay in the book? It, just because of connection to David, or because it's his opinion. You know, what justifies that? He's just telling you his opinion. Yeah. No. And I don't think he says, I know this is right. But he's got, as you said, he contradicted himself a number of times. So, just some guy writing in here. Not interesting. I think it's in because it highlights for us, it pulls up a mirror. Your whole life is just about you. This is how you're going to be at the end of the day. You match that with other parts of scripture that say, say your life's you know, about more than you, about 
God, then it, it uh, has a whole different flavor to it. So if you get stuck with just thinking that you're it, you've got a if, the, Yeah, the more you focus on just you, yeah. the littler your life gets. But, but doesn't Martin Luther in the Reformation affirm the value of regular daily work? Luther says, you know, if you are a shoemaker, do it the best you can. Yeah, because sure. every work is valuable under God. I, I read here, whatever it is in your power to do, do it with all your might. And part of part of me is, well, isn't that kind of what the great reformers were saying? You may not be a priest or a bishop, but you may make shoes, you may uh, plant wheat, uh, what you do, do with all your might. So I'm just saying parts of it uh, were reflected in what the reformers were saying about the value of what I do day by day that may not in the world's eyes look as important as a pope or a bishop or a cardinal, but I'm following this advice. I'm going to uh, plant wheat with all my might and uh, reap it. I'm, I'm just reflecting on that from yeah, the- but you're taking one verse out of the whole thing. I think that is what the reformers said, and I agree with you. But I think the overall message here is much more about futility. I mean, the guy's clinically depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not much question. I get to the bottom of it and say, say, do a shrink. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think one of the interesting things, there, there's that, there's a refrain in the course that appear over, 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 over again. And you say, okay, this is how he sees reality. This is his answer to it. Live in the moment right. and get the most yeah. out of the moment. Now, whether that's satisfactory for you in terms of how you live your life, that's another question. Um, but this is where he's coming out. And again, it's focused anthropocentric. It's focused here, not theocentric. And you got to keep that in mind in terms of his of how he approaches things. And it's interesting. I saw in you know in six ten there's a sense of resignation. And I give you two translations here. Everything's already been decided. It's long known long ago. Each person would be, and and that's sort of re uh, cyclical nature of how things uh, unfold. So there's no use of arguing with God about your destiny. Accept who you are, how things are, and go ahead. Hebrew Bible, study Bible says, whatever happens in the designated long ago, and it was known that it would happen. So as for man, he cannot contend with that which is stronger than he, i.e. God. Uh, and so you look at that and you go, hmm. So no matter what energy you put into your efforts, you ultimate, your ultimate destiny is already set. Therefore, why not be resigned to this reality and live fully in the moment? Um, that's one way to come at that. And then the problem then at the bottom in terms of um, the possibility of the meaninglessness of life, of life, he's looking for coherence and comprehensibility. Not get it. You can't get that. Um, you're, you're going to end up frustrated. And, and basically it reveals contradictions in life. And I think, Rob, back to what you were saying, life is full of contradictions. And, and the question is, how do you learn to live with contradictions? And uh, he's going nuts. And yeah, life is full of contradictions. Yeah. Uh, and, and some people just cannot come to that point. And he, he, he really, really struggles with that. So um, I give you, we're running short, the terms of looking at if you wanted a cheat sheet for the sermon today, look at six. And, and you read six down to the bottom of the page, you'll get sort of a, a, a cheat sheet of what John's going to talk about in his sermon. What I really want to go to is the last page. <clears throat> so what does it all mean? And I want to look at how Michael Fox and Seattle <clears throat> to give you their takes on Ecclesiastes. They don't, they're different. They're different takes. Now remember when I said you could read 15 commentators and come up with 15 different answers. 
And I, I like the way these two guys come at this. Uh, you may not like either one of them, but I think they, they, they sort of try to corral some kind of meaning for Ecclesiastes. Um, so Michael Fox comes to three conclusions about Koalith's thought. One, Koalith is chiefly concerned with rationality of existence, which he denies by calling everything Havel, breath or vanity. Two, he does not attack wisdom, the wise or doctrines of wisdom, literature, but expresses his esteem for wisdom. Three, not finding meaning in the world, Koalith affirms the grasping of inner experience, emotional and intellectual, as the one domain of human freedom. Yet, even this is not wholly satisfactory. Fox attempts to name the contradictions of Koalith and examine them rather than explain them away. He doesn't need to explain them away. Main contradictions are for him. Toil is absurd and without profit, and yet provides the wealth that provide joy. Koalith affirms and denies the possibility and the value of wisdom. Life is unjust, but God is just. Interesting conclusion as you look at it. Another one is Chun Lian Xiao who is aware of the danger of systematizing an experiential thinking with luck. He tries to capture both the theological and philosophical aspects of Koalith in a summary paragraph of his commentary, which is really a very good commentary, the Anchor Bible series. In sum, he says, Koalith always begins his reflection of humanity and the human condition. He concludes at every turn, that mortals are not in control of things that happen in the world. They are not in control of their destiny. This is why Koalith says that everything is Havel. He does not mean that everything is meaningless or insignificant, but that everything is beyond human apprehension and comprehension. But in thinking about humanity, Koalith also speaks about God. <coughs> People are caught in the situation where everything is Havel, in every sense of the word. God is transcendent, holy other, but humanity is on earth. Yet God is related to humanity, and God has given humanity the possibilities of each moment. Hence, people must accept what happens, whether good or bad. They must respond spontaneously to life, even in the midst of uncertainties, and accept both the possibilities and the limitations of their being. I think both of those give you an angle get a handle on what Ecclesiastes is about. Does it give you answers? No. But it gives you a perspective um, in terms of things. Now, the, the fifth note summary talks, number two, about where God fits in. Ecclesiastes uses Elohim for God in every author. Every author, which is a different kind of perspective and that little paragraph talks you a little bit about something. John hit it right when he says, in the face of all senselessness, Cole basically says carpe diem. That's all he says is carpe diem. I said, John, talk about that some more. But he doesn't. He just goes singing past that. But he does say that. Now, live in a moment. Celebrate the life you have. Now is certain the future is not. So appreciate what you have and don't waste your energy turning over what you don't. Um, is that satisfactory? I don't know. Um, but that's sort of where he comes out. And then the five is sort of the summary of, of the book. So, um, what continues to engage the moral philosophic imagination uh, is the writer who envisaged the same grim fate for rich and poor, for righteous and wicked, and who has led to question whether wisdom itself in the end has any advantage over force. So what I'm trying to give you is sort of a big picture and the main things to look for as you go through. And since it's only 12 chapters, you have a lot to reflect on. Don't be frustrated because you're going to see contradictions. And you're going to say, this guy needs to go see a therapist. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, and yet, you know, you, you can relate to a lot of the things that he sees 
and and you have to say, I wish, I wish you could be a little happier about fun. Now, my question is, how would he? This is just Ecclesiastes. Forget anybody else. Just Ecclesiastes. How would he? What would be his take on what happened in Texas? You see, it's a cycle. This happens every week. Well, yeah, he was saying, what happened to Connecticut? What happened to Columbine? Yeah, Buffalo. 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 Yeah, you see, it's just a cycle. And, uh, you know, sadly, sadly, but he's true. I mean, it happens every week. Would he say every week, or would he say it happens occasionally, but it's going to happen, has happened in the past and will? Yeah, almost every, every day. Uh, would he say, therefore, you don't do anything? Maybe. Or what you do won't work, won't solve it. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the past? It might be in Proverbs where they talk about mourning at funerals being better than being at a, you know, a feast, a party, because you have, you know, those feelings. Um, you know, and you get certain feelings from losing you know, if it's stock market or whatever, you get these feelings in life. And the whole point I've heard of Ecclesiastes too is like the attitude. You know, even with those feelings, um, your attitude is to accept them. And then, um, and uh, I, I've seen, you know, the, the Ecclesiastes, um, you know, speaking about attitude, whatever position you are, in this battery of life, your, your attitude is to accept it, and, you know, life, your, um, you know, the, the big picture is it's uh, all about um, God and praising God, and I think through that attitude, acceptance, showing, you know, kind of the praising of God, and when you don't do that, and it's still self-focused, you end up with all the disappointments you speak of here. Um, that's my little bit there. But I can't, I can't, I don't, maybe that's in Proverbs or they talk about it's better to be at a funeral or maybe it's it in here. I can't remember. I think that's in Proverbs. Yeah, but that's, yeah. I see that as tying, a verse tying into, into um, this year. Because you're not to worry about dying too much. Anybody else? I, I, I think Ecclesiastes is extremely contemporary. It, 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 the questions it's asking are ones we still ask today. And I think it's approaches like contemporary life because it's so individualistic. It's about me, me, me. And this is, I think, about as far as you can get from the prophets, where it says our life is about life together, about the community. And Ecclesiastes is more about like, well, you know, they've got their issues and their problems and I've got mine. And so I, I think Ecclesiastes is contemporary, but I would say contemporary in a, in a bad way. Um, I, 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 I think that's one of those beautiful things, like Martin was saying, is like, why do we have this? It's just one guy's opinion. But I think we've all been at some point in our life in this state of mind, which I'm grateful that it's in here, because at some point in our lives, we need to read something like this. But I think the beauty of the tradition is, hopefully we're being pulled more toward the prophets in a life of community oriented toward God other rather than just, you know, I don't feel good. Um, not to dismiss people's feelings in like a curt way, but I think that's a stage among the path uh, and not the goal. But I can see why they say that he was influenced by the Greeks, because a lot of this is very stoic. There's nothing you can do. Fate's going to determine everything. But he comes out with an empirical to the conclusion. Yeah. The stoics say, well, what you do is if your goal is apathia. I don't. I don't feel it. Whereas the Epicureans said, "Eat, drink, be merry." Right. And so I can see where they come from saying he's Greek, even though chronologically that, that you know, he's not. That's true. But that probably means that we've all had the same thoughts processes yeah. over the ages. Yes. Uh, Vibor in his book, uh, Christ of Culture, uh, ends up with saying, uh, from his point of view, probably the best response is a transformation of culture, which 
most people have read as kind of a Calvinistic, Reformed, Presbyterian attitude that God puts us on earth to heal the earth, to restore the earth, to transform the earth in a positive way. And uh, I, I would agree with that personally, uh, that point of view. But I see very little of that here, at least the assets, very little of that. Um, you know, um, my whole understanding of the church, the doctrine, the biblical interpretation that I've grown up with uh, is that God puts us on earth to be salt and light in a, in a positive way, not just a condemning way, but in a positive way. But I, see, I don't see that agency in here. That would be my reaction. That even even with the shootings, I know that there are many ideas uh, about it. I don't agree with all, but at least there are people that are trying to be an agent in minimizing that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, but I don't even, I don't see that sense of agency in here. I, that Bob would bother me. Last one. I'm just a little about to take. I grew up to be such a deep kid. I've been trying to save the planet and the other since I was born. So when I finally get to a verse that says, He drinking me, Mary, I go, Yes. I feel one moment, one moment, those people are back as if you were too merry and too drinky, then you're guilt. So you have guilt and trying to yeah, save yeah, souls like, and all the world also like a it's a yippee person. I can have a glass of wine and laugh and not go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What a great way to end it. Ed? Yes. Well, I, th I think Martin mentioned the, the idea of a, a clinical trial with one patient. Actually, this is a clinical trial with one doctor, uh, <laughs> and he's treating himself. And uh, one of the rules of medicine is, is if what you're doing doesn't work, try something different. And try to look at an example of things that do work and emulate them rather than saying, aha, well, you know, that's the way it goes. And I, I think this is, if you bring up the business of massacre of children, you ought to look to where they don't do that and see what they do. And maybe there's a lesson there that most of the rest of the world has learned that we could uh, uh, emulate. That's Thanks, Ed. Sure. Let's pray. Holy, gracious, loving God, we give you thanks for each other and for this chance to meet again around your scriptures. We give you thanks today for wisdom literature and specifically for Ecclesiastes. Help us in the week ahead to wrestle with this text and its message and to know that beyond just eating and drinking and being merry, there is the other two, but that this life is filled with many experiences and many possibilities. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chuck. That was Thanks, a hard, Chuck. That was a hard book to teach. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.